。はい、えー、それでは帝国となりましたので、えー、第101回国際 ARC セミナーを開催させていただきます。司会の鈴木です。どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。えー、本日はスペシャルゲストをお迎えしまして、えー、開催させていただきます。英国インイーストアングリア大学日本史、えー、講師でいらっしゃいますナリン・ウィレム先生を、えー、ゲストスピーカーとしてお呼びすることができました、えー。ウィレム先生につきましては、えー、ユージニア・ボジャノバ・カマ先生の方から、えー、イントロダクションをどうぞよろしくお願いいたします。あこんにちは皆さん、鈴木先生、どうもありがとうございました。Um, I will be moving on in English after this. It was my great pleasure to welcome once more students of the of University of、uh, Ritsumegan University and of the University of East Anglia. It's always、uh, really, really nice to have those joint sessions and to get a chance to,、uh, to talk to our colleagues across. Across the continent.、Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague,、uh, Dr. Nadine Williams, who is a historian、uh, based at the University of East Anglia. And so she primarily focuses on the modern Japan. And she has several areas of specialization, which are、uh, rural communities in Japan, northern, northern areas. I know that she's very interested, interested in Aino culture and also she's working with poetry a lot. So she's a historian, but in her methodology, she looks、uh, across other fields. So she looks at poetry, she looks at、uh, regional communities, and she also look,、uh, works with ethnographic、uh, records. Um, and、uh, she recently published a book、uh, called Ishikawa Sanchiro's Geographical Imagination Transnational Anarchism and the Reconfiguration of Early Life in、uh, 20th Century Japan,、uh, which was published in 2020 by the University of Leiden Press, which is a great,、uh, great contribution to,、uh, to scholarship. And、uh, Nadine, please,、uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm,、um, I'm very pleased to be here, of course. And I would like to thank the Art Research Center、uh, for giving me this opportunity to share some of my research findings today. And I'm particularly grateful to、uh, Professor Akama, who agreed to the digitization of the material that is at the core of my project.、Uh, I also want to thank、uh, Ryoko Matsuba from CISJAC in the UK, who was crucial、uh, intermediary. Uh, Miyako, Miwako Hayashi Bitmed, whose help with the transcription and research is invaluable. And of course, the Takeuchi family, who has been very helpful and uh, trusting uh, in uh, letting me have a look at these、uh, materials. So, today I'd like to, to introduce you to a set of、uh, Historical records. I call them diaries for better,、um, for lack of a better word at the moment, but、uh, these、uh, records are both, these diaries are both、uh, written and pictorial,、uh, which have not yet been made accessible to the public. And these、uh, diaries were produced by Takeuchi Tadao, a young farmer in civil life and a military、uh, conscript. Who was dispatched to Siberia in 1920 in the context of the Siberian intervention? More about this a bit later. And in this lecture, what I really want to do is to highlight the contradictions and the difficulties of military life for young recruits like Takeuchi by analyzing these sources against the background、uh, of the progressive and changing mindset during the Taisho period. Uh, and, and what is referred to as Taisho democracy. So, this is part of a larger project that looks at the Siberian intervention from the perspective of rank and file、uh, ordinary soldiers. And I, I must、um, insist on the fact that it's still a work in progress. So, I'll be looking forward to your comments and, and questions after this. So, first about the sources themselves. I, I came across these diaries by chance, and after some investigation, I realized that the,、uh, the, they were kept by the family of the soldier s somewhere in Nagano prefect, Prefecture.、Um, and also, there are rare documents. No one seemed interested in exploring further what they had to say about the, this particular war experience. Um, that they chronicle. So I tracked the, diary down, the diaries down, and、uh, this is what they are.、Uh, 
Um, well done. Yes. So there, there are four sets of um, papers, basically. So this is the first one, and these were produced in 1920 on site. It's a set of 109 drawings made by uh, Takeuchi. Uh, some text is uh, included sometimes in the drawings. Uh, and then there's a, um, a set of two notebooks. Uh, this is one of them with uh, a lot of text, notes, and some drawings too. Uh, then we have um, a set of uh, drawings with text that is basically has, that, that has been realized in 1921 once Takeuchi was back home and he produced this uh, nice narrative of the experience, the war experience of his uh, regiment there in uh, Siberia. And then the, the last set is um, a set is a, is a diary, uh, a written chronicle of the the war, uh, the war experience of this battalion that he put uh, neatly uh, a year later, this, uh, a year after coming back from uh, Siberia. So um, very interesting sources. And these documents are uh, particularly interesting for three reasons. Uh, well, first, it's clear that uh, Takeuchi was a talented artist and his drawings are actually very rare. In fact, they're possibly unique because there is no other example of uh, sketches and drawings of the Siberian intervention, uh, at least on a, in a sustained, uh, developed in a sustained way. I mean, there are a few uh, sketches here and there, but he really told a story uh, through these um, uh, drawings. Uh, and they're, they're also very expressive and convey well the impact that the war and months in Siberia had on, on him. Uh, secondly, the first part of the material was produced on site, so the sources are not a recollection after the fact, but convey the events with immediacy, and, uh, and there's a certain degree of, a certain degree of reliability. Uh, and finally, even written personal uh, person, first person accounts of the Siberian intervention are few and far between. There are only a few known examples of diaries produced by Japanese soldiers altogether. And amongst them, um, personal testimonies by rank and file soldiers, as opposed to officers, uh, at the time are also quite rare. Um, in contrast with the, the Russo-Japanese War, of 1904-1905 and the uh, Asia-Pacific War, um, th these, uh, of, in, in these conflicts, the diaries are uh, not only available more readily, but also have been widely investigated by historians. So these diaries are really an opportunity to write, to, to write, to consider, to think about, and to write the history of the Siberian intervention uh, from below, so from the rank and file, so from the point of view of the rank and file soldiers, as opposed to a, a top-down history, which emphasizes diplomatic uh, negotiations, uh, uh, political history, and, and so forth. Um, so the, these sources are pretty special, uh, and they document a, a very complex conflict too. I'm not going to do into too much detail because it is, uh, in fact, enormously complex. But uh, let's remember, let's first point out the fact that this is called the Forgotten War uh, by uh, Japanese scholars, in, in particular uh, Asada Masafumi uh, Sensei. And uh, indeed, there's very little awareness, uh, even in Japan, uh, about this conflict among the general population. When mention is made of uh, Siberia, and war, it's always the experience of the Siberian internment that comes up when at the end of the Pacific War in 1945, about 600,000 Japanese servicemen and civilians were forcibly taken from Northeast Asia to labor camps in, um, in Siberia by the Soviet authorities and remained there long after the end of the war. And I, I would recommend that you read the photograph of uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Shazot Muminov at the University of uh, East Anglia, who's just produced a monograph on this, uh, on this topic. 
So for most people, the Siberian intervention is indeed a war uh, better forgotten. The conflicts, the conflict laid bare Japan's military opportunism and territorial ambitions in the region, but concluded in uh, strategic confusion and uh, nothing gained. And the lives of about 3,000 servicemen were, were uh, unnecessarily lost. In fact, about 1,400 died in battle and uh, more than 1,700 died of disease. And I'll go back to this a little bit later. Um, that the conflict um, lasted for uh, over four years. And you can see here on, on this map uh, in shaded gray, the where the Japanese troops were present in Siberia, and Siberia is really the generic term here, but it's uh, the, the Japanese were in the, the maritime province um, here uh, along the, 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 the sea and the, um, the Amur region all the way here, um, Manchuria, North Manchuria, here the, the Transbaikal region and Chita, which is uh, which was the main uh, center there of the trans at the time. Uh, the, so the city of Chita is where Takeuchi was stationed during this, this uh, uh, time. Uh, and also uh, northern Sakhalin and Kamchatka. So it was uh, an enormously wide uh, expanse of territory on which the Japanese were present at the time. Um, so the Siberian intervention, the Japan intervened um, in Siberia at the request of the allied, allied powers after the fall of the Tsarist regime in Russia in 1917 and the subsequent collapse of the Eastern Front in World War I. And the intervention was supposed to help the so-called uh, Czechoslovak uh, legion, so uh, to uh, uh, about 50,000 combatants are stranded in non-allied territory to make its way to Vladivostok. Um, that there were other object objectives such as ensuring the safety of ammunition, stockpiles and armaments, and also of course supporting the white Russian anti-Bolshevik forces uh, over there. Now, um, Japan's uh, army general staff, however, quickly saw the collapse of Tsarist Russia as an opportunity to facilitate the creation of a communist free buffer state to the east of Lake Baikal and exert increasing economic and political influence in the region. And also, although the government, the Japanese government was initially reluctant to go ahead with the intervention, the Japanese military eventually deployed altogether uh, 73,000 Japanese troops, more than 10 times the 7,000 men uh, strong contingent that had been suggested by the, uh, the US. So um, a huge operation. And as I said, uh, it, was, it brought no gain to Japan, uh, a lot of resentment uh, from the local populations and the death, uh, unnecessary death. So um, who was Takeuchi Tadao? Uh, very briefly, he was, as I said, a young farmer. He was uh, raising, uh, cultivate, uh, raising silkworms in Nagano Prefecture. This is the Otagiri area. Uh, he was uh, from uh, Otagiri and uh, this is the area right now. So very mountainous um, area. Uh, he was also cultivating uh, cereals and, and root vegetables. But uh, very importantly, he also learned uh, drawing and, and design from uh, a local artist called Ogawa Ryusui. Uh, there is little record, records left about Ogawa uh, Ryusui, except that we know he was quite well known in the area. And there was in Nagano a prefecture or in, in the area, a tradition of uh, learning by uh, images and uh, as we know the, the literacy rate in that particular region of Japan has had always been very high so there was a, a good environment for Takeuchi to learn these skills and to to express them. 
Um, and so here he is in the, um, uh, before leaving for Siberia in a, in a picture that was taken, a commemorative picture. Uh, and he was thus part of this uh, 58th Regiment of the 13th uh, Infantry Division located in um, Takada, which is uh, now Joetsu City. And so he was coming from Nagano, so quite a, a northern part of Japan. Um, and so there he, he left uh, in January 1920. And I put here a Japanese map because it shows you, I mean, the, the, um, the route he took uh, is very clear here. So he left from uh, Tsuruga port and then went to Busan uh, at the tip here of Korea, uh, went up to Shenyang, uh, Changchung, Harbin, uh, Chichiha, uh, Manzuli, and then arrived in Chita uh, almost uh, three weeks later. And to give you an idea of the kind of uh, records or the kind of narrative he gives in his final, uh, yeah, his final narration of his war, ex war experience with the 58th Regiment, uh, starting on the right here. So he says, uh, the troops leave port on 19th January aboard the Mannari Maru under the command of Colonel, uh, Colonel Takeuchi, um, no relation to him, and uh, facing the Imperial Palace, uh, make a respectful salute to what uh, Tokyo um, and it may be the last time for them to see their country. So uh, you can see them all on the deck there, uh, bowing to the, um, towards the Imperial Palace. Uh, and here, the, the second picture here is Takeuchi arriving in Busan in Korea on 22nd January. Local citizens give an excited welcome to the regiment in the city of Busan. Buoyant fireworks lit the sky and then he says, the foreigners we see for the first time look quite funny. And um, I, I will come back to this, this idea of the, the funny foreigners, because in fact, for someone like Takeuchi, uh, going uh, to war to Siberia was, of course, the first time the people like him could, would leave Japan and encounter the foreign. So that uh, makes for very interesting comments and um, images. So um, I think it is relevant here to quickly consider the propaganda images that were available at the time of the Siberian intervention uh, and use these as, a point of, um, as points of comparison with Takeuchi's drawings. So perhaps you have heard of uh, Sensoga, the, uh, the war prints that were very popular during the first Sino-Japanese war in uh, 1894, 1895, uh, and to some extent still popular during the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, these, this popularity was not repeated during the Siberian intervention, but there exists a set of 17 lithographic prints that were published by Shobido, the publisher Shobido, uh, between 1918 and 1920. Uh, the artist was uh, probably Tanaka Ryozo, who was a, a seasoned artist of uh, uh, Sensoga. And uh, as you can see from this, this kind of uh, propaganda, of course, they are propaganda, so they're not expected to be uh, faithful to reality necessarily. And they were most of the time produced on the basis of existing photographs. So um, here you have the, the picture, the, the images of the Japanese army. Uh, occupying Blagoveshengs, and um, immediately you can see that it is a bird's eye view, so uh, something very wide from the top that shows a kind of uh, control of the territory, uh, the technological superiority of the Japanese forces. I mean, those are characteristics of these propaganda pictures that were quite popular during the, the time. Uh, and uh, the Japanese, of course, are uh, portrayed as heroes, uh, colorful explosions that Trump, accur Trump accuracy is also another characteristic. 
uh, and it portrays the ill-equipped enemy. So here you can see that everything is so orderly, so neat, uh, including the um, surrender uh, of the enemy that deposit their, their arms there. Um, and if you compare uh, this one to one of Takeuchi's pictures, you see immediately the difference. So Takeuchi was really writing and drawing from the ground. So he had a, a very immediate view uh, of what was happening at eye level, at, at, yeah, at ground level, while, the, while the, these propaganda pictures always to give this impression of control and mastery, uh, depict scenes from high up. And in this case, you've got the Japanese planes uh, showing their superior technology. But on the right, you have Takeuchi's drawing showing that the planes are actually enemy planes uh, dropping bombs on the Japanese troops who are uh, stationed in uh, train carriages. Uh, and of course, there's no uh, it, it's not very surprising that the propaganda <laughs> showed a nice picture and that the reality was, was very different. But what I think is interesting here is that Takeuchi um, was not too much influenced by this uh, Sensoga and that he really wanted to show things the way they were. And he was faithful to his... Uh, to the reality and to, to his audience um, by depicting to a large extent things as they were. Uh, you have here um, another, another example of this con contrast between what Takeuchi was depicting and what propaganda was suggesting. Uh, in the, on the left here, you have this propaganda picture of Siberia, Siberia that looks like a very lush uh, and welcoming uh, territory. Uh, it's green, it seems warm. Well, in fact, when you look at the pictures made by Takeuchi, he says here the, the forest is deep and, and dense, in fact, um, uh, but the forest is, is dark even in daytime. And the, the idea of uh, lush Siberia really does not appear in his uh, drawings uh, in, in the whole set of drawings is rather a very hostile, harsh uh, climate and uh, territory. So um, what I'm going to do now is to go through several aspects of what it meant going to war uh, during the, the Taisho period. And, and I think um, what I would like to, to emphasize here is that um, the, the drawing and the diaries reflect the cultural and intellectual trends of the time uh, at the same time as they questioned also the premises of Japan as a modern state, uh, to some extent, not um, very radically or vocally, but you can see some cracks or some uh, doubts in being instilled by uh, Takeuchi in, his, um, in the way he reflect on the war. So I'm going to talk about these uh, various various aspects uh, of uh, the Taisho period and, and how uh, the, this is reflected in the, the pictures. Um, first, uh, talking about Taisho individualism. What I mean here is that um, if you if you look at the way these Pechanka barracks, so the military barracks, are depicted, you can see the the birch trees uh, in the foreground, and, and and it shows really the skill uh, as an artist of Takeuchi, but also his uh, expressiveness as an individual. So individualism was a major preoccupation which emerged after the Russo-Japanese War in various media and. Um, during the, the Taisho era. And the, this discourse of uh, individualism uh, circulated uh, and touched upon a, a variety of fields, political, social, cultural. And at a basic level, it, it perhaps represented a reaction to the omnipresence and hold of the state in the everyday life. And it was especially debated and espoused among a growing, growing population of urban dwellers. Um, but as suggested 
derogatively by Kaneko Mitsuharu, who was an intellectual poet at the time, and I quote, rather than to their country, the children of the Taisho era were only thinking about themselves. Um, so that's, of course, a negative aspect, but there was a sense that uh, individual was uh, had to have the, a chance, much have had a chance to express uh, themselves. And the, in this uh, picture, I think, shows that uh, Takeuchi, as a farmer, even as a farmer, had this, uh, this ability and this willingness. Um, so this self-expression and self-realization had become part of the vocabulary of the masses. Uh, Tadao uh, Takeuchi, even though he was a farmer living in a relatively isolated area, distant from the capital, had perhaps adopted such a mindset. Uh, he developed his own mode of expression and felt the need to pursue it. Um, so um, this willingness to express himself and uh, uh, appeared equally in the, his attempts to write uh, poetry. Um, I mean, he, he did succeed. I, I cannot judge of the, the actual uh, quality of this poetry, but here you have a, a parody of a song that he wrote about Siberia. Uh, it, it's a bit long, so I'm not going to translate it all, but uh, apparently at that time, there was a, a military song that started with Haruwa, uh, Ureshi, so um, spring is a happy time and it goes for uh, Natsu, so summer and uh, autumn and winter. And uh, Takeuchi wrote a poem in this, in this first uh, draft there saying Haruwa Kurushiya. So the spring was uh, harsh, was a bitter time. He says, spring is a bitter time on the Siberian plain where there is neither grass nor tree the sand is ceaseless on the ground and faces and eyes are half covered. And so uh, we, we cannot see anything. And then he goes on and each season is basically uh, a, a bitter time for those who are in Siberia. So again, this is a, an example of his willingness to express himself uh, through these um, war records really. Um, the expression dying from the states, dying, sorry, dying for the states, uh, Kopka no Tame, comes back very often in his diaries, in his records. And um, he was apparently assigned the task of chronicling the Siberian experience for his regiment, uh, which may that indeed say, have saved his life. But to some extent, um, therefore, we should understand these drawings and notes as a reflection of this assignment. Um, he to offer a narration of the Siberian intervention for the 58th Regiment, uh, and therefore, to some extent, also paint the army's actions in a relatively good light. Um, but the fact that he was able to express himself through drawing and writing also represented an opportunity to openly reflect on his military experience. So I, I think that these drawings convey some underlying criticism, or at least a degree of doubt about the justification uh, for the loss of so many lives. So Japan established the conscription uh, in uh, 1872, uh, 73, and uh, soon after the, the Meiji Re Revolution, taking France and Prussia in particular as a model for the organization of the army. And this is the time of the uh, rich country, strong army and an army, uh, I mean, um, the military, of course, are part of the development of a modern state. Uh, and the Conscription meant repaying an obligation to the state in the form of a blood tax. Uh, the system remained in place until 1945. And when Takeuchi joined the Takada regiment, he was sent off by the Otagiri village, a special, of, a special military affairs committee as a soldier paying his due to the state. 
and on his return, the same committee praised those like him who had braved the cold and bullets of Siberia for the sake of the state. So this is really the consecrated formula. Um, the situation, however, during the, the Taisho period was um, becoming a little bit fractious in the sense that this um, devotion to the military and this acceptance of the block tax was no longer that, that easy. Uh, the, there were an increasing number of soldiers evading or trying to evade the draft. The Imperial Japanese Army itself was concerned about the, the soldiers' discipline and mindset, uh, especially because of this discourse of peace and democracy and so forth was circulating and individualism was more uh, praised than, uh, than devotion to the state. So there was a, a waning trust in the military. Uh, moreover, we, we can add to this that the public opinion was uh, quite against the intervention, not entirely, but they were uh, much less support for this uh, Siberian intervention than they had been for the, the Russo-Japanese war. So the situation during the Taisho period is quite different from what it was during the, the Russo-Japanese war. Um, and here you can see these pictures of uh, simply uh, death and dead soldiers. Uh, these soldiers seem to be um, non-Japanese because you can see the, the cap, the fur cap. So they are either uh, enemy soldiers or they are the allies of Japan uh, in Siberia who were uh, dressed with a similar hats. But you can see here on the right, a propaganda picture, which is also a battle where one of the pro uh, protagonists died and this is the, the Captain Konomi, but he died in the battle as a hero. Uh, you don't see any sense of heroism or glory in uh, Takeuchi's pictures. In fact, it's uh, really dying of um, an inglorious death. Um, in here, you can see the uh, heroic are act, but the heroic act is not actually uh, defeating the enemy. The heroic act is the to retrieve the corpse, uh, the the body of one of the uh, officers who um, uh, died during the battle. So the heroism is is done to the the young private um, Fukusaki who went to retrieve that body. But again, it is it is a uh, inglorious. Um, and I should show you here uh, again one of these um, pictures of death and death in battle. And, and here they are clearly Japanese soldiers, uh, I think, because you can see the little uh, flag. But uh, what I find interesting is that uh, if you look at the, the written diary and all these expressions of um, acceptance of sacrificing oneself for the state or for the sake of the state or, or the nation. But then if you put that, you, ju you juxtapose these to the pictures themselves, there, there is very much of a, uh, a contradiction or something, uh, some kind of um, discomfort with the, uh, the idea of offering oneself to the state because it is really uh, miserable, and, and I think that's what that's one of the aspects of these um, records is that they suggest perhaps that there were some doubts during the the Taisho period about the role of the army and whether um, all of this was uh, acceptable or justified. Uh, and again, another one, and here I, I put a, one of the poems. Here. It's a, it's actually. A tanka, it seems, uh, my beloved family, even abandoned for the sake of the nation. Corpses are littered on the Siberian plains. And in one of these uh, drawings, he uh, also writes some kind of a poem and he mentions all these places where corpses, Japanese uh, soldiers, the corpses of Japanese soldiers uh, are, are 
had been uh, killed. So he mentions um, Nicodix and Irkuts and uh, Nerchings and all that. These are places um, in, in Siberia. So um, the, the soldiers experience I think differed uh, between the, the Russo-Japanese war and the Siberian intervention. And uh, looking at these diaries is a way of trying to understand to what extent it was different and, and how. Um, the same formulae uh, appear for the state, for the sake of the state, but I think that the biggest difference is really the clear rationale that was there for the uh, Russo-Japanese war uh, it was a question of preserving the integrity and the sovereignty of Japan by going to war against Russia in the early 20th century. In the case of the Siberian intervention, there was no clear rationale, and at least the soldiers of the, the rank of Takeuchi did not exactly understand what they were doing there. Um, and so there is a, a little bit of a waning trust in the military uh, in the, at the time of the Siberian intervention, while the military is still felt as a necessary institution uh, at the time of the Russo-Japanese war. And as I said before, the, the level of support for these two conflicts was quite uh, different. So um, when I talk about rationale of the conflict, I mean, this has been documented uh, by uh, historians already, is that there was no clear understanding from the point of view of the rank and file soldiers about who this enemy was. And this is a picture that perhaps uh, exemplifies or at least illustrates that feeling that it was not clear who the enemy was. Um, they were confusing language issues, of course, since both enemies and allies in Siberia spoke the same language, which was Russian. Um, in the written diary, there were words used for the enemy, partisans, uh, kakumekat, so the, the revolutionaries, the kagekiha, the, uh, the radicals, or the, the supporters, the, the anti, the, the, the Bolsheviks, sorry, um, the enemy, uh, but none of it really, nowhere is it explains, does it explain why these people are supposed to be the, the enemy. So uh, there is really a confusion there, and uh, that made the, the situation for the soldiers, uh, I think, quite difficult. Um, the, the other issue is that the, the Japanese um, troops at that time around Chita relied on the, uh, the support or, or rather supported themselves. I mean, there was cooperation between uh, Gregory Semenov, who was a, a local uh, Cossack leader, uh, anti-Bolshevik, who um, was also quite uh, ruthless and uh, remembered for his uh, brutality. Um, but you can see through, throughout the narrative and particularly throughout, throughout the several drawings that there's some, um, some admiration or at least some interest in these Cossacks that are quite uh, big, I mean, in stature and quite impressive in the way they man, uh, manipulate arms and, and so forth. Um, but, and, and this is quite, um, in a way, a difficult picture to to look at. Uh, this is on the right side, you have uh, Gregory uh, Semenov. Uh, and on the left side, a picture made by Takeuchi that shows the execution of a prisoner of war by one of the allies of Japan. And um, of course, you, you don't see that very often in the kind of in those kind of diaries, you, they don't talk necessarily easily about their own uh, acts of uh, brutality or, or lawlessness in this case, uh, and um, or ones of, of these their allies. So this is, this is quite interesting, I think. And of course, this picture was not reproduced in the final uh, narrative that came out a year after, but this is certainly one, uh, and there's a, another similar one 
in the, the first uh, set of uh, drawings. So uh, Grigory Semenov was in fact a volatile and merciless commander whose name, and I quote, uh, became synonymous with the worst atrocities of the civil war. Uh, and, and this is really the reality. The reality was that these Japanese soldiers were thrown into uh, the, the civil war and uh, had to, you know, well, I don't know whether they had to, but they, they went along and uh, you can, um, um, they went along with the, the actions of someone like uh, Semenov. Um, this is taking place at a time when the uh, discourse was also one of international cooperation. And once the, so we're talking about here, uh, 1920, just about, just after what has been called the 1919 moment, when uh, Japan is fundamentally um, espousing this idea of international, these ideas of international cooperation, uh, it's Japan's arrival to the center of global politics and uh, a confident Japan on the world stage. Uh, and these idea of cooperation, of course, were put forward by President uh, Wilson's 14 points. And these, uh, you know, notions of open diplomacy, the um, reduction of armaments, the um, uh, negotiation, uh, diplomatic negotiation, really, really uh, are part of the, the new discourse of the era. Uh, and I, I think perhaps uh, someone like Takeuchi was somehow uh, influenced by that kind of discourse. If you look at um, this drawing, which I find very interesting in the first uh, set of uh, of the diaries where he writes, I mean, he draw this, this bird uh, with peace in the world, um, Sekai no Hewa. Again, this is something that you don't necessarily find in soldiers' diaries that are in the middle of a <clears throat> civil war and are um, asked to really uh, fight for, for their life and for, um, for their country. Um, of course, there are contradictions because uh, if you see one of these drawings from the, the second set, the, the ones that he, he did uh, on his return, although it's based on one that he that was available in, in the first set of drawings, you can see that um, he accepts the fact that uh, villagers suffer from the war, even though they've done nothing, but he says these things are to be expected on the battlefield, so it, ca it cannot be helped. So. Um, there's a conflict here. Um, I talked earlier about encountering the foreign, and I think that's uh, one of these uh, very interesting aspects of these diaries is that they have in a way um, an ethnographic value because it is how Takeuchi saw this foreign, um, this foreign land and foreign people because uh, we have to keep in mind that we're talking about Siberia, but in fact, uh, in Siberia at the time, they were not just Russians, both allies and, and enemies, and Japanese, but they were Mongols, Buryats, um, Chinese, Koreans, some indigenous peoples, including the Nivsk, and, uh, and of course, uh, other nationalities from the alliance, or at least until uh, 1920, but um, this, this is similar, in fact, to what happened uh, during the Russo-Japanese War, is that the war was an opportunity for young recruits to encounter the foreign, but you can see that Takeshi was quite interested in depicting these foreign uh, people. Uh, you have the Korean doctor here and the policeman and the um, the, the local um, military figure uh, and the, a peasant. Uh, and then of course, the on the picture of the right, you see that he describes and paint, I mean, draws Chinese laborers 
using the derogative term for Chinese laborers at the time, which was a uh, chankoro. So he's, he's not, of course, immune to using the, the kind of vocabulary that was used in his time. Uh, but there is some kind of wonder, if you go through these pictures, or wonder and interest in the way these foreign people live. Uh, there are lots of descriptions of their uh, habits in uh, eating, uh, the houses, uh, transportation too, he was quite interested because as a farmer, he was interested on how the farmers there transported things and, and use uh, locomotion. Um, of course, there was interest in these Cossacks. I, I mentioned that before. Here you've got another description of a Cossack uh, cavalry soldier. Um, and uh, interest in the city, uh, it so happened that the Japanese were housed for a while in the select hotel in Chita, which had been requisitioned for the Japanese army and the, the allied of, uh, from under Semenov. And he draws here the, the city of Chita. And he says, um, he observes, uh, of, observed scenes of chaos and desperation as the citizens of the magnificent city who yesterday enjoyed a carefree and peaceful life so their dreams shattered under a hail of fire. Uh, so he's, he's concerned about the inhabitants, but he's also, um, so that there's also this contradiction, but as you can see, he uh, paints the inhabitants, uh, the, the city dwellers uh, quite well here. And there's a postcard of that particular hotel which got destroyed uh, a few months later, actually, uh, or a couple of years later. Um, during the civil war. Um, the foreign again, learning Russian, there, there are several pages of his notebook where Takeuchi uh, wrote vocabulary in Russian with the Japanese translation. And of course that was for uh, usefulness because uh, communication was a problem. But also, I think he was a, a genuinely uh, curious mind and, and wanting to learn because uh, there are some notes that say that he was practicing his Russian conversation. And he basically had um, what seemed to be a quite a good relationship with the, the local Russians. Of course, this is uh, difficult to, to, assert, to, to check. Um, and then let's not forget that this was also the, the Taisho period when Japan was expanding its, uh, its colonies and um, the imperial mindset was certainly present. So you've got uh, here um, the need for, I mean, the, the fact that Takeuchi emphasizes the, that the Russians are all afraid of her of Japan's military strength. So that was part of the, um, the mindset, um, the, the imperialist mindset, I think. Um, and um, this is the, the, the final part is about the, the everyday reality of the Siberian war. And here, perhaps there is not much difference with other war of uh, modern Japan, the, the modern uh, Japan's wars, such as the, the Russo-Japanese war, the first Sino-Japanese war, and to, to an extent the, the Pacific war. But um, what is perhaps a little bit different is the, the harsh climate. I mean, the, the cold was uh, unbearable. Uh, and also the unintelligibility of the conflict, which are, of which are, I have talked already, but I, I think this is certainly one of the strong, char uh, clear characteristics of that conflict. Uh, I'm talking from the mindset of the, the soldiers, the understanding of the soldiers, because we're talking here about a ground view, uh, ground understanding of this conflict. Um, and so talking about the... The, the logistics, of course, the, the territory was a vast territory, and uh, this had to be organized very often. Uh, I mean, transportation had to be organized. Um, here it mentions that the means of transportations were 
uh, hired from the, the Russians, um, vast territory, and um, mentioned before that the terrain was quite um, hostile, uh, not only mountains, of course, but also these very, very thick uh, and dense forests. So you, as a fighter, as a soldier, you would not necessarily see uh, much ahead uh, or see the even the enemy. Uh, and that was one of the other problems of this, this war. Um, the cold. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot to say about the cold because this is one uh, consistent lament that comes through this these uh, written diaries, but also in the, the depictions. I hear you have this uh, soldier who is dressed uh, to protect with a protective gear uh, against the cold, but it has been also documented the fact that uh, it was never enough. And I, I put a, an article to show how the, the, case of, uh, the cases of frostbite were quite uh, common during the uh, the conflict in, in Siberia, and, and you know even someone like uh, Takeuchi, who was used to the cold, living in the mountains of Nagano Prefecture, uh, of course was not uh, prepared for that kind of uh, intensity of cold. Uh, it, it also has been documented that these soldiers were not well equipped, and they they would uh, add cotton padding. Uh, under their clothing to try to keep warm, but uh, it was, of course, uh, very, very uh, challenging. So um, he, he talks about unspeakable cold and uh, cold that cannot be imagined and the words that, that not enough to describe the cold. And he draws several scenes of these soldiers uh, trying to uh, to withstand the, the cold and having to cook breakfast uh, in cold conditions and so forth. Uh, so it, it was um, a problem, I mean, a, a personal in, a personal problem for, for him who was trying to draw, but certainly it created a lot of, um, I mean, caused a lot of casualties among the, the soldiers. Um, and I talked earlier about um, illnesses of course, it was still the time of the Spanish flu, influenza, and so several soldiers uh, were hit by the flu. So the, the problem of uh, illnesses was certainly another aspect of that uh, conflict, although this is not um, specific to the Siberian intervention. Um, talking about the lack of food and lack of uh, water to drink. One of the problems in the winter is that the water was frozen and there was no time uh, to melt the water or there was no, or it was dangerous to lit a fire not to uh, melt, the, melt the water. So that the soldier was desperate sometimes to find some water and you have here these soldiers uh, quickly getting some water from um, a stream, um, and he mentions also the the hunger, the you know very often lack of food, uh, even going to battle. So it was a a concern. Uh, what was also a concern, and this is um, the case in, in many conflicts, is is the boredom. Basically, the boredom of uh, having to cook. Here he said, having to cook for thirty people uh, in a train carriage. Three, three meals a day, uh, so that was uh, that was difficult. Um, not only difficult um, materially, but also because they had to had keep uh, doing this routine work. And and basically, in uh, during the six months he was in Siberia, the actual combat uh, lasted for uh, about a, a dozen days maximum in, in two two spurts of combat. So it was certainly not a lot. Um, and um, the rest of the time they had to 
to keep themselves busy, although the, the routine work kept them busy, uh, of course. But he does, again, he talks about this time that was unspeakably dull. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the reality of, of death. There are several images of Japanese uh, soldiers being carried on stretchers uh, from the, the battlefield. Um, morale often dipped as the, the reality of insuffi insufficient food and sleep sank in. The satisfaction of eliminating and dispersing the assailants was succeeded by the realization that the task remained immense and the means were not proportionate to the proposed ends. Uh, that certainly was the case. Um, Takuchi listed the names of 30 men from the Takada regiment who died during the, these operations in Chita and mentioned that another 140 men sustained injuries. Um, so, he was um, about six months on, on Russian soil, soil and uh, he had participated in two offensive, offensives of a few days each. Um, and this is uh, one of these very miserable, I mean, a picture of, of misery, really, uh, 300 enemy bodies. He commiserates. Um, even about the, the enemies here um, after the battle, there is acute misery and suffering. And I'm going to conclude with a really only a few words about what these diaries, and I say diaries, but in fact, some of it is written in the form of a diary with a um, some notes or some pictures for every day, but uh, some of it is just, you can call them uh, historical records or uh, records of the Siberian intervention because it's not all in the form of diaries. So um, what I, I think is really important in this case is really the rarity of these records and that they allow us to visualize the Siberian intervention, not through photography, but through really the eyes of uh, rank and file soldiers just on the ground here, on the ground in Siberia. Um, and as I've tried to suggest, uh, soldiers going to war during the Taisho period perhaps went with a different mindset than one who went to war during the Russo-Japanese war. Of course, this is to some extent debatable, but I think there were differences and the way they saw this conflict uh, with some doubts about the, the role of the states and their place in the states uh, perhaps appears in, in some of these drawings. Um, and, and I think the final point is also the way the Siberian intervention is being remembered. In fact, it hasn't been remembered. And that's why these records also are important. There is a, a very partial or selective memory of the, the conflicts. Um, what I've talked about here are these operations, these uh, military operations around the city of Chita. But the, as I said before earlier, the Japanese troops were present in several places and there were massacres, there were atrocities committed. Uh, on both sides, and um, what is remembered is, of course, where the when the Japanese uh, troops or even civilians were victims. Uh, but uh, I, I think the conflict itself perhaps deserves a little bit more than this selective memory and the analysis and exploration of these diaries and historical records, perhaps give an opportunity to reflect on this memory. Okay, I'm going to, to stop here. Um, stop sharing. Here we are. All right. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Uh, it gave us a lot of things to think about, uh, certainly. Um, are there any questions? Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand, uh, raise your voice.
to somebody. And I can go ahead and maybe just to break the <laughs> silence for now. Yeah, I and and it would be good if you know some students could join in uh, as well. I actually, it's thank you, Nadine, for a really fascinating talk. It's really rich material, and I think you can continue, you know, talking about it much longer because there's so much into into this. Um, I do have some uh, questions. Uh, let me start with two brief ones and then maybe we'll see whether we get more from students so first is did he have any training in uh, drawing because you know some of them was uh, quite skilled or like you know how did it come that he decided to actually draw rather than just write a text um, and also uh, this form of taking notes while actually being there on the ground if is that how I understand it so that he actually did all of this while being in Siberia right um so Regarding the first question, mm -hmm. he had a training in drawing. In fact, he had started when he was, um, I think, an adolescent, I mean, quite quite young anyway, with a local artist called Ogawa Ryusui. Um, mm -hmm. But there is very little information that remains about Ogawa Ryusui, except that we know he was quite well known in the area and he participated in, in exhibitions. Um, and as I, this is part of my ongoing research, is to try to find out within Nagano Prefecture how common it was for some from a, for a mm. farmer to to learn drawing like this. I mean, he was not a a wealthy farmer. He was um, Just his, average. yeah average. His family were landowners, but you know th this is all uh, relative and limited in. Uh, in terms of uh, wealth, certainly, and they did suffer from, uh, uh, you know, lack of, of resources mm. in, in some some cases. But um, so he did learn drawing, and he, he was very keen, um, and possibly partly because there was a movement in the in Nagano region to uh, promote the use of. Uh, you know the, the artistic mm. skills amongst farming communities um, so that that's quite interesting um, taking notes well I, I think he was assigned this uh, role this task yeah. of uh, taking okay. notes and because he had these skills he was uh, an obvious choice um, but there's no records left about how this happened and who actually assigned Mm -hmm. to do this and so but uh, we can only assume that it was um something that had been asked uh, to him because otherwise yeah. how would he possibly be able to do it i mean he exactly, was obviously yes. not, not part of the actual combat he was there as an observer although very very close to the the battles so um Yes, thank you. And there's also lots of questions, you know, taking notes in that context also, because he's depicting, um, you know, real um, casualties, so like real people dying on both sides, uh, whether, you know, it's probably hard to ask for us to know right now, but just what's, you know, if he was assigned this task, was he allowed to depict certain things and not allowed to depict something else? And, you know, this, this politics of... Mm -hmm what do you actually see and what is your own position versus what you, you know within this well, rules yes. what is what is possible i, I think that the the there or well the the initial idea was really to provide a narration of the 58th regiment there in siberia and so there is a sense when you read the the written there is a, and some of these pictures is to show the might uh, and the accomplishments and the of this um Battalion and with some some words of glory uh, for the, the you know the, the Imperial Japanese Army and and so forth. But again, there's not only that. And if you put that next to all these scenes of of misery, of uh, sadness, or the, the scenes, the the picture of the the peace bird, I think that's quite uh, striking actually. Um, you know that that there was something else here. And um, censorship uh, was certainly not as strong as it would become during the the next the Pacific War, uh, the Asia Pacific War. So there, there was at that time still the possibility to to be a bit critical. Uh, you know, there was no harsh censorship. So I think he had some freedom uh, of expression. 
Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Really, really interesting. Uh, would, at some point, would be curious to go over everything, but uh, maybe more questions from students, preferably. <laughs> So you said he was assigned to draw, hmm. uh, illustrate. Uh, the, after coming back from Siberia, did he keep on drawing something or did he left some memoir of the Siberian invention or anything like well, that? Um, all these papers, this, this material was actually kept by the family hmm. um, for a hundred years uh, and it, it's still uh, in the hands of the family but he it seems that what he had done was actually not used by this 50th battalion and I think this is partly because this um, Siberian intervention was such a failure um, in fact in Japanese it's uh, Siberia Shippe and they used to call it the Siberia Shippai so the you know, the Siberian failure. Um, and so really nobody wanted to hear about it anymore. And I, I assume, though this is just a guess, that, uh, you know, all these things about the Siberian intervention were probably kept quiet. Um, and that's why these, these documents were, never came out. And even the, you know, some um, soldiers or officers wrote about the Siberian intervention or wrote diaries. And a couple of them I, I've looked at, they've, they were only discovered after the, the death of their author. So, and they were only published after that, after then, because these people didn't want to show it or didn't want to discuss it after coming back from the conflict. So that is really an ambiguous um, perception of that conflict. So it was kept as like a family secret. Um, yes, I know. Actually, there are several like that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, several, you know, all together, there are more than 10, I think. But, mm -hmm. but um, these uh, diaries or, or notes were taken uh, then and there. Um, some had remained, but uh, it's quite difficult to get access to them mm. because people don't necessarily want to show them. Or um, uh, on the other hand, I mean, the, the people who participated in these conflicts didn't really want this to come out. On the other hand, the the family itself, I think, is quite pleased to have um, the you know the creations or at least the, the records done by their grandfathers or ancestors uh, made public or being seen. I think it's part of the, the memory process. Um, can I ask on this as well? So is there any memories within the family about, about him? And, you know, how does it correlate with, with, with the diary? Well, or... I, have, I, I did visit the family um, three times already and the you know they live somewhere in the in the hills in uh, Nagano, um, and they, they were aware of the existence of these uh, diaries. But it only came out at the time uh, at the hundred years anniversary, so two thousand and eighteen, and there was a, an article in the paper. But nobody is really interested in them. That that is why it's so strange because scholars. Um, I have talked about the Siberian intervention in terms of diplomatic history and you know the the political forces in at play, but that you know there's not that much interest uh, in the lives of these soldiers. Although even though I think that they, you know, they deserve a little bit of uh, attention, um, yeah. But the family, yes, uh, the family. Um, knew about these, the skill of their grandfather and, uh, you know, they, they had kept this material, yeah.
Everybody's so quiet. Nihongo de mo i deskredo mo. Moshi yoroshikata da. えっと、事務局の方、うんえー、YouTube で入っていらっしゃる方からクエスチョンとかありますか、はい、?YouTube には特に何も入っておりません。はい。はい Okay, can I once, you know, we're waiting for more questions to come in because I did have something else as well about his own perspective and then something that you can read in the diary there.、Um, With, like, how did, is there any comments or any、um, you know, thoughts about how he felt himself about being there? So, whether he, you know, it was just, okay, I didn't have choice, I'm in this situation and that's what I'm doing, or whether there was some motivation to actually be doing what he's supposed to be doing and he was, what is, he is expected to be doing. And also, how much is understanding?、Uh, Of, like, larger situation and larger, like, larger context of this conflict in the scrolls, because it's very much about, you know, everyday life and what they're eating and how they're、mm -hmm. struggling with the cold and everything. But, you know, the contextualization of why actually are we there?、Mm -hmm. And,、uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Well, in fact, when it, come, when it comes to the larger conflict, the understanding of this larger conflict, there's no, not a, a line or a word that,、um, Makes you think that he understands why he's there.、Uh, so he, he used that word,、uh, teki, enemy, and k a g e k i h a the Bolshevik supporters, really. But that's all, that's all there is to describe the, the conflict. So, we, so, so the, the, there's nothing. So that, that's definitely、um, unclear in, in his mind, I think. Um, when it comes to accepting being there, well, there, there are some passages in the written diary or even what is written by, on the side of the, the pictures where he, you know, he praises the, the might of the Japanese、uh, Imperial Army, the Imperial Japanese Army, and where there's some, also some excitement about going to combat, and especially after the, you know, they've been there for three and a half months. Without doing anything. And then there's finally some、um, announcement saying that they would go to battle the next day. And then there's a, 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 there are a couple of lines saying, you know,、uh, everybody has got their, their blood boiling with excitement. So, that, in that sense, yes, there was a, a sense that what they were doing was, was part of what was expected from them as military men,、uh, as servicemen. Yeah. You know, I, I would like to have some comments about the, the quality of the pictures themselves. Whether,、uh, because I think that sometimes, I mean, to some extent, it could be linked to some、um, manga type almost, manga type drawings where, where there is a, the picture and then the, an explanation or that, that kind of style. Where does it come from? I mean, I personally, I'm not an art historian. So I'd love to have some comments from.、Uh, People who are a bit more familiar with that kind of、um, representation. Yes, I wonder whether Ryoko is there. I think she is. Maybe she can comment on manga a bit more. What, when I was looking at this, what、uh, the associations I was having is more like e m a k i So、oh. that's you know, like a bit older form, but it's clearly t h i s pictorial narratives, so which has different ways of. Um, you know, of, of telling the stories through both text and image. And it's usually text and image、uh, parts are um, um, consequent. So,、uh, yes, I, I think in terms of from what I've seen from this、uh, document, it, it probably fits into that form of organizing the narrative. But I don't know, somebody who is more familiar with manga,、uh, maybe. Well, not necessarily manga, but something that. What does it、um, suggest to you in terms of you know, the quality of the drawing and the, the way it's the, the way of the representation?、Um, may I just、um, comment on that? 
the questions. I think at the time is caricature. The manga itself is the meaning is not the same as today. I, I, I suppose it's sort of like a manga. Is you can see it's sort of like a manga manbun. Um, also, like satire or caricature is in the um, realm of the manga as well. But I think it's it, especially it's 1920. It's sort of like the magazines, propaganda magazine, and also like the manga artist at the time is quite active on the sort of like manga magazine series. And it's I, I really understand that Takeuchi is quite self-taught artist, but also it's probably is he had probably had the chance to sort of like um, a newspaper manga series or Gigi manga series or Tokyo Park, um, sort of like the caricature or um, propaganda um, imagery at that time. And this is probably sort of like the imagery might be inspired around that material, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think my, my next step is really to go to Nagano Prefecture and try to, to see the kind of uh, art education that was available for people like him in, you know, in these rural communities and what kind of magazines perhaps circulated at the time. To see what would have inspired him. Um, and also, if there are other examples of this diary, so, you know, notes, are they done in a similar style or are they very different or are they more, all more or less coherent? That's also... Well, war diaries uh, for the Siberian intervention, they are none, actually. I mean, pictorial, war uh, pictorials. There are, you know, a few sketches here and there, but um, there's nothing uh, the like. But I, I should probably look in more details into what is available uh, for the Russo-Japanese war. Uh, yeah. So uh, the illustrations uh, of the diary, are they like uh, colored by watercolor? Um, yes, the, the, the pictures is uh, yeah, the watercolor. Um, Afterwards, so the, the whole oh, is all in, in black ink, and then there's some wa some uh, watercolor added. Yes, so, and the text are uh, written by a, a Chinese ink brush. Uh, it looks like it. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you 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 mean like uh, he just sketched uh, while he was in Siberia, and he colored. No, no, he sketched when he was in Siberia. And then when he came back, I think he redid the, uh, the pictures. So he re, on the basis of these sketches. So, so these are new, um, it's a new notebook. It's a new, new paper, new, new sketches, but on the basis of what he had done while in Siberia. I see. Yeah. Mm. And he did it right after coming back or? Uh, within a, a year. So yes, um, you know, yeah, right after coming back, he, he just did the, he finalized that work, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Matsuba-san said, ah, okay. Uh, we do have uh, about 10 minutes open to the public. Nijibai先生にあの漫画家風のことちょっと聞いたらいいんじゃないですか。答えなければ。矢野先生の顔見えましたね。あ、だ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ
by uh, Takeuchi. So uh, I'm I'm geographers. So I'm very interested in the location in the, uh, of uh, picture in Siberia. Um, I'm wondering uh, you have the uh, exact large scale maps uh, at that time. So uh, could you identify the location, uh, exact location uh, of paint in Siberia uh, through the in some diary or another uh, material? Um, yes, that, that's a very good question. Uh, he did provide some maps in his diary himself so that he drew the, the location of where the, the army was. Uh, and he also tells the story of the battles and with, uh, you know, uh, chronologically. Mm -hmm. And he mentions all the villages uh, they went through and where the battles took place and the rivers and the, so, mm -hmm. and this is, it's possible to uh, make that coincide with the records we have uh, in the, um, the Siberia Shupeshi, you know, that provided by, by the army uh, and what is available uh, as, public records about uh, how these battles took place and where. So that, that is uh, very possible to do. There's only one place I haven't been able to identify. It, so I'm still okay. looking for um, this place in Siberia called Nair Ching, I think, but I can't find it yet. But I, I mean, it's going to appear at one point. Yes. Okay, and uh, also I, I've been interested in the uh, Gazatia. Gazatia means uh, uh, place name beast. Um, so I'm wondering, the, at that time, the map shows uh, Siberian language or Japanese language maps and uh, some Russian map. Well, what, what, yes. what he drew was uh, a Japanese rendering of the Russian. So he was in Katakana um, based on the, the Russian name. And that's why sometimes it's difficult to find. <laughs> because, for example, the um, the select hotel, mm -hmm. I, I I couldn't find what it was. I really couldn't find out what it was, because he he wrote in katakana sede futo sede futo, and I suppose that in Russian is select. I mean the 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 K or the C sounds like F a little bit. I, I mean I, I don't know. I don't speak Russian sadly, but so um, but I had a a Japanese scholars who speaks Russian who could who actually found it so uh, so you know it's it's quite tricky because these are sometimes are little villages and they've disappeared the name has disappeared so it doesn't yeah. exist anymore yeah. so even if you look in Russian it just doesn't appear yeah. because yeah. it's um it's no longer existent uh, under that particular name um, yeah. but I'm, I'm almost there there's only one left <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm uh, quite interested in the old maps and uh, around the Jap um, Japan and uh, 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 East Asian country. So uh, World War II, uh, Japanese military created uh, maps uh, we call Gai Hozu. Mm -hmm. So uh, recently, Gai Hozu uh, is uh, data rising. And the, and the public. Oh, right, right, right. So I, I, I if I have the chance, I try to identify the location. Oh, the thank you. Place name. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Any other questions? If there are any more no more questions. Uh, it's about time, so maybe able to conclude this talk for the public part. Uh, 
。OK。ちょっとじゃあ一つ一つだけ。はい。あの質問じゃないんですけど、あのこんこえっ、ー、とすみませんじゃあ,あの日本日本語で質問しますけど、あのこんなあの、えー、まあ興味深い資料がまあ一旦あの新聞にも載ったわけですよね。でえっ、ー、とまあ知ってる人は知ってる状態になったにもかかわらず日本人が全く興味を示さなかった理由は何だと思いますか Um, so, why there is a little interest on the part of, of scholars? Well, I, I think, I mean, actually, I just gave a talk to the,、uh, the Nichiro Kankeishi、um, Kenkyukai, and、uh, there was some, some interest, but again, this is、um, a conflict where it's, it's extremely complex, for one thing. So it's really in,、uh, difficult to understand、uh, because this was a, a civil war with、uh, so many ethnic groups and, and local、um, warlords law, and、uh, the Japanese with、um, conflicting、uh, objectives. And the objectives actually of the, the intervention changed over time. So, for one thing, it's, it's quite complex. So, the scholars who worked on that. They're quite interested in this complexity. So, that, you know, that's basically occupied their, their interest.、Um, the life of uh, soldiers, uh, because they, they were not,、uh, as we know, they were not victims either,、um, which very often brings about some interest in, the,、um, in this, the life of the soldiers. I mean, they were. Uh, two occurrences when the Japanese、uh, suffer heavy, suffered heavy loss, the Japanese troops and, and some civilians suffered heavy losses. One was in、uh, Nikolaevsk in、uh, 1920, and the other one was in Yufta in 1919. And these two incidents are being talked about and have been、uh, explored in the, among scholars. But beyond that, For some reason, people don't really want to know or don't really want to go. But, but I think actually,、um, on the basis of the、um, reception I got from this uh, Japanese, uh, Russian, the Russo Japanese Society, I think that this kind of diaries and this kind of material will、um, bring some more interest in the, this conflict. And, and perhaps, I mean, my hope is that. There will be something made about,、uh, written about this、uh, rank and file soldiers, soldiers, you know, the, perspe the perspective of the soldiers rather than the, the top down、uh, perspective. So, again, I thank you for your、um, help with、uh, digitizing the, the material because it's going to be. Made available to the public、uh, in not too long, I hope now, and, and with these explanations. And I, I think that will generate some interest and perhaps some more research into this. I got to go there. I know, 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 まあ、もちろんあの絵も面白いし内容も面白いんだけれどもあの、えーまあ、どうしたらいいかっていうような感じでした。で、まあ、この、えー、タイミングでですね、まあ、戦争が、まあ、起きているタイミングであのに日本人が、えー、行っていた、まあ、あの行為と、まあ、今世界で行われている行為というのが、まあ、非常に重なるわけですから。えー、とそこをもう一回考え直すのに、今、あの多分日本,日本人一般の人たちは、えー、と日本側,か側の,その、えー、ニュースによってしか、まあ、今回の、えー、戦争を、ね、理解してないわけですけども、こういうものがあることによって、もう一回あの考え直させられることになるなということで、えーまあ、今回、あのちょっとか限られたね、30人ぐらいの参加者の中ですけれども、あのぜひ、えー、早く<笑>、早くというのは申し訳ないんですけど、あのパブリックにな、あの資料にしていただけるようにあの、よろしくお願いいたします。はい、頑張って,、はい、張ってます、はいはい。ありがとうございます。はい、高山先生、ありがとうございました。
。えっ、ー、と、それではですね、えー、公開の時間は、えー、ここまでとさせていただきますが、えっ、ー、と、その前にちょっと、来週、えっ、ー、と、次回のセミナーのご案内をさせてください。えー、次回102回目の、えー、国際 ARC セミナーは、2週間後、えー、5月25日の、えー、この時間となります。えー、次回の講師は、えー、久留米工業高等専門学校の助教をしていらっしゃいます、常木かな先生と、えー、本学の、えー、客員助教でいらっしゃいます、バトジャガル、えー、ブルゲサイハン先生、お二人をお願いしておりますので、またどうぞご参加ください。えー、so, this is the end of the public. Uh, Zoom uh, conference part. So, thank you for all the people who join、uh, to this seminar. But,、uh, University of East Anglia students and the faculty m e m b e r as well as、uh, ALC、uh, faculty and the students, please stay tuned. We're going to have another 30 minute、uh, talk and discussion,、uh, not open to the public. Uh, we stay,、uh, keep on talking about this interesting topic.、えー、それでは他の皆様は、えー、ここで、えー、Zoom を切っていただいて、えー、ください